Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. Today I'm going to talk about valve gear on locomotives. You ever wonder what all those little levers and stuff on the side of a steam locomotive are actually doing? Let's find out right now. Locomotive valve gear actually comes in many, many different kinds and they were types that were prominent in Britain, that were not prominent in North America and vice versa and similarly all around the world. What we're going to be talking about today is called Walshirts valve gear named after the Belgian fellow who invented it. However, quick fun fact about the Pennsylvania A3 switcher that I'm building, Kozo actually changed the valve gear. On the left here, I've got an HO model of a Pennsylvania A3 switcher, and you can see that the linkages on it are much simpler on the outside than on the right-hand model of a similar 040 switcher. The Pennsylvania A3 switcher actually did not have Walshirt's valve gear. It had Stevenson valve gear, which was a common earlier set of valve gear. Kozo, when he modeled his A3, changed it to Walshirt's valve gear, partly because it's much easier to model at this small size. With Stevenson gear, many of the linkages that you see are actually inside the frames, and on a model at 3.5 inch gauge, there's not a lot of room in there. The oil pump and the water pump and so on have to go in there, so putting it all on the outside like Walshirt's is easier to model, and Walshirt's valve gear is just way cooler and more fun to look at, which is kind of the whole point of building these models. Furthermore, Walshirt's valve gear is much easier to set the timing on because everything is external. Thus, all you rivet counters who got mad at me for liverying my A3 with Canadian Pacific, who never actually owned A3 switchers, well, turns out this entire locomotive was fictional all along because it's got Walshirt's valve gear on it. How do you like them apples? I'm going to explain Walshirt's at kind of an abstract level because I want you to understand just enough to know what it is I'm going to be building because it'll be more fun if you understand what all the linkages do. However, if you want a really deep dive with a lot more detail, then I'm going to link to two videos below, one with a great explanation of Walshirts, and another video by Eccentric Engineer, who makes great products also, by the way, that explains how to design Walshirts valve gear if you want to build your own locomotive. Okay, but aside from looking really cool, what problem is valve gear actually solving? Let's relate it to a modern automobile, since you're probably more familiar with those. An automobile has to be able to stop, start, move efficiently at high speed, and move in reverse, and pull fairly heavy loads. Now, internal combustion engines have two key weaknesses. They can only run well in a very, very narrow RPM range, and they can only run in one direction. The way you get such a limited form of propulsion to do all of those other things I just described is with a transmission. The transmission in your car allows it to move slowly or move quickly. It allows it to pull heavy loads from a standstill, or at high speed, it allows it to run efficiently. Now, steam engines are a very different animal. Steam engines actually don't have those limitations. They develop maximum torque at zero RPM, and they have full torque throughout their RPM range, unlike internal combustion, and they can run in reverse just as well. So a transmission, assuming you could even build one strong enough to pull a train, which you probably couldn't or it wouldn't be practical, a transmission is not a good solution for a locomotive. Instead, we can do all of that with valve gear. And we're going to do it in ways similar to modern car engines, which use variable valve timing. So you might have seen VVTLI or VTEC or Venos. The brands all have their own name for it, but it's a similar concept. If you thought Honda invented variable valve timing, well, turns out, Steam locomotives did it in 1849. Let's figure out then what all those little linkages that you see are actually doing. Here is the basic geometry of a steam locomotive. We've got our four drivers, and we've got a piston and a valve. Of course, you know the drivers are connected by side rods to transmit power between them, and the piston is connected to the rear driver with a main rod and a crosshead and that translates the linear reciprocating motion of the piston into the rotational motion needed by the drive wheels. So this is, in effect, the crankshaft arrangement of a steam locomotive. So far, so good, right? However, this isn't an engine yet because the valve can't move in time. The job of the valve gear is to slide that valve back and forth such that it's connecting the steam coming in from the boiler to each side of the piston at just the right moment to push the piston back the other way. Of course, steam engines are double acting, unlike internal combustion, so we need to be shuttling steam from one end to the other, rather than just opening and closing at a particular moment. Every stroke in a steam engine is a power stroke. For a basic slide valve engine, like the A3 switcher, 
Valve timing at its most basic is simple. The valve needs to be half a stroke ahead of the piston so that when the piston is at the end of its stroke on each end of the cylinder, the valve is already there, letting steam in to help cushion the piston as it comes in at the end of the stroke and to push it back the other way. A simple way to do this then is to add an extra little crankshaft on the main driver that we call the return crank, and we orient that crank at 90 degrees to the main crank. So it's creating an eccentric point that's hovering above the center of the drive wheel, 90 degrees off from where the main rod is. And that 90 degree forward rotation puts the valve half a stroke ahead of the piston. Simple, right? So now if we imagine connecting those temporarily with a, a rigid rod like this, this should in theory create the basic valve motion that we need. And there it goes. This engine would actually run, although quite poorly. The main weaknesses here are that it can only run forward and it can only run under one condition. It can run at a constant speed and roughly constant load because the valve timing is fixed. This is actually the valve timing used by stationary engines, which makes sense. Locomotive valve gear evolved from stationary engines, which came before locomotives did. And for a stationary engine, this works just fine. This is all they need because stationary engines are used for running generators or line shafts in factories or pumping water, things like that, where you've got a constant load and a constant speed, and the valve timing thus is very simple. However, of course, this is not nearly good enough for a locomotive. Like we said at the top, locomotives need to run at different speeds, need to run efficiently at high speed, need to get going from a standstill, and need to be able to go in reverse. There's some other issues with this setup as well. The valve motion is quite poor quality. The valve events are not going to be crisp. They're going to be kind of mushy because the valve is sort of lazily sliding over the ports and the valve is moving a whole lot further than it needs to because of the action of that return crank. There's one more problem with this arrangement. We don't have a good way to control the lead of the steam admission into the cylinder. Lead on a steam engine is very analogous to ignition advance on a combustion engine. The steam needs to get led into the end of the cylinder a little bit before the piston gets there so the steam has time to get in there and start expanding similar to how you need the spark to ignite a little bit before the piston gets to top dead center in a combustion engine. In a combustion engine, you also want more and more spark advance the faster the engine is running because the piston is moving faster and you need more time for that combustion to occur. The analogy to that in steam is called cutoff and we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so first problem to solve, we need to give the engine the right amount of lead. One way we could do that, of course, is just by moving the return crank a little bit further around leading the piston by a little bit more than 90 degrees. That would work. In fact, that's how stationary engines do it, but that only works in a forward direction. Of course, our locomotive needs to run in reverse, and the lead actually has to go the other way in reverse. The return crank needs to be a little bit behind 90 degrees in that case. You could try to come up with some sort of complicated adjustable return crank, but Walshertz does this a much simpler way. The secret is the engine itself knows which direction it needs to fudge the valve in order to maintain proper lead. So if the piston's moving forward, we need to cheat the valve a little bit backwards. If it's moving backwards, we need to cheat it a little bit forward. And we can achieve that with the combination lever. This lever connects to the crosshead with the union link, and now watch what happens. As the piston moves back and forth, it's exerting influence over what the return crank thinks the valve's position should be. The combination lever is actually doing math. It's combining the engine's suggestion for valve position with the return crank's suggestion for valve position. And the ratio in which those two suggestions are combined is set by the positions of all of those pivots. Because the attachment point for the crosshead is way below the pivot on that combination lever, the piston is only exerting a little bit of influence. I think a good way to understand this is that this is actually acting as an analog computer. It's taking a set of inputs from disparate sources and mathematically combining them into the exact correct valve position for each moment in time. In fact, this is a little bit of calculus that it's doing, and it's very similar to, for example, the mechanical firing solution calculators that Navy warships used on their deck guns in World War II. Calculating a firing solution for a deck gun on a ship is very complicated. The ship is rolling, the targets are moving, there's wind, the weights of the shelves vary, and so on and they used mechanical computers consisting of gears and cams and so on to calculate those solutions. Well, locomotive valve gear is a much simpler version of the same idea. It is a mechanical analog computer. Now, let's make our computer a little bit more sophisticated, however, because 
we don't have enough control yet over our locomotive. We've got our lead, and in fact that combination lever is what makes Walshirt's valve gear constant lead valve gear. That's a very key innovation of this mechanism. At all different speeds and in reverse, the valve gear always has the same amount of lead. That's a tremendous advantage for efficiency and proper running of the locomotive. We still have two problems here though. One, the valve is still moving much too far. It doesn't actually need to move nearly as much as the piston does. And we don't have any control over the locomotive yet. We can't move it in reverse and our valve timing is still constant and we need to vary it with our velocity. So we can solve all of those problems by adding one more clever little linkage. This is called the expansion link. Instead of driving the valve directly from the return crank, we separate those orange and blue linkages and have the blue linkage ride in this slot in this expansion link. And the expansion link itself pivots on the link bracket in the center. That extra pivot point reduces the motion of the return crank as transmitted through the blue lever into the valve. You could of course also shorten that motion by modifying the return crank, but by creating this extra linkage, now with that blue rod extending past the pivot point, we can hang some extra control linkages on the end of that, and now we can move that blue linkage and change the range of motion that it imparts from the return crank. These linkages connect into the cab and allow the engineer to control that pivot point and thus control the range of motion of the valve. If you look closely at that valve, you'll see this has actually solved multiple problems. In addition to now restricting the valve to a much smaller range of motion, which is all it needs, the valve motion now is actually crisp across the ports. And that's because there are parts of the stroke where the piston is pushing in one direction and the expansion link is pulling in the other, and the combination lever is canceling out some of that motion, which maintains the right amount of lead, but then as the piston goes over top or bottom dead center, the two forces, the piston and the expansion link, are pushing in the same direction, which actually accelerates the valve and shortens the valve events, makes them crisp. That gives you the nice snap from the stack that you want and creates much cleaner and more efficient running. Now there are a lot more subtleties than this in Walshirt's valve gear, but this is just one example of how clever all of this actually is. That's why you'll want to watch the videos that I've linked to below for a much deeper dive into all of this stuff. But what about that control that I talked about? Well, the position that you see here with that blue rod, which by the way is called the radius rod, sitting at the bottom of the expansion link, this is what's called full gear. This is kind of like the acceleration mode of the valve gear. This is where you've got maximum power at lower speeds. What the expansion link is actually doing is controlling cutoff. This is the other half of that ignition advance analogy I talked about. When the engine is running at low speed, trying to get rolling, pulling a heavy load, you want as much steam getting in there as possible. You want that steam admission valve open for a long time. However, at high speed, you actually want much, much less steam being admitted for two reasons. One, you don't need as much power to keep rolling at high speed. You've got momentum on your side. But two, because the piston is moving so much faster, the steam doesn't have as much time to expand in the cylinder. So if you dump too much in there, then before it has a chance to expand, the piston has already cycled back and is starting to push against your expansion. The engine is actually going to be fighting you. So you have to be able to reduce the cutoff at higher speed. That's what that expansion link with the curved slot in it allows us to do. The radius of that slot, interestingly, is the length of the radius arm to the combination lever. That's important because we don't want changing the cutoff to affect the length of the stroke of the return crank. So we can move the cutoff without affecting valve position because it's rotating around that point on the combination lever. But wait, there's more. Watch what happens if I pull up a little bit on that engineer's linkage to pull the end of the radius rod up a little bit in that expansion link you see that the amount of swing being transmitted from the return crank is now much less. This makes cutoff happen much sooner, the valve is open for less time, less steam is getting into the cylinder, but because of that combination lever, the lead is still the same. Again, that's the cleverness of wall shirts. This position is called hooking up the gear or notching back, depending on your preferred jargon. Notching back, so-called because the quadrant lever that controls this expansion lever pivot point has notches in it, and there's just two distinct notches on each side of the quadrant, because while in theory Walshirt's looks like it would operate 
at any number of positions in an analog way, there's actually only a couple of positions where it operates efficiently. So those positions are carved into the quadrant as notches that the engineer uses. Again, there's some subtleties here that I'm glossing over. See the videos below for more in depth. This is the valve gear position then that you would use at high speed. Short cutoff, very efficient, saving water and fuel, and this, the engine isn't fighting itself because the piston is moving quickly and there isn't enough steam expansion time in there. So this is analogous to a higher gear in your car on the highway. You've no doubt noticed that curved slot goes above the pivot point on the link bracket as well on the expansion link. What happens if we move the radius rod above that? Well, you've probably already guessed by now. Now we've reversed the influence of the return crank on the valve. And this, as you might have guessed, runs the engine in reverse, just like magic. Again, this is the cleverness of Walshirt's valve gear. It manages to get two completely different valve profiles in one set of linkages because of the use of that expansion link which allows us to move the pivot point above and below center. Other valve gears typically did this by having multiple eccentrics. That's how Stevenson valve gear works, for example, and that's how a lot of stationary engines that needed to reverse did it. They had multiple return cranks effectively. But with outside valve gear like this, that's really quite impractical. There's no geometric way to do that. And by doing it with this expansion link, again, we don't have to have two sets of gear to control the proper lead. Regardless of the direction of that expansion link pivot, the combination lever is always going to give us the correct lead. You might have been wondering, well, what happens if that pivot point on the radius rod is right in the center of that expansion link? Then what happens? Well, this happens. You can see that the return crank is now not moving the valve at all, only the combination lever is. The engine wouldn't really run in this position, but you can see there is still a small amount of movement coming from the valve. So what you're seeing here is just the pure lead of the valve. This is just the ignition advance, if you like. No actual timing on the engine. So this position is kind of an illegal one, but it shows you the cleverness of the combination lever, how even at zero gear hookup, it's still doing the right thing with lead. That's Walshirt's gear in a nutshell. Uh, if you're interested in this, you might also look up Baker valve gear, which came along after this. It replaces the expansion link with a bell crank and a series of linkages. It had some other advantages and disadvantages. I'll throw a video down below about Baker gear as well. And of course, the Brits had Joy gear and Hackworth gear, and there was so many other valve gears. Wikipedia has great pages on most of them if you're interested. And now, we're going to start building all of these linkages and seeing this thing come to life. So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making this all happen, and I'll see you next time.